This is Don Hollenbeck in the newsroom, set up in the Capuchin Convent in the city of Carretero, Mexico. In 20 minutes on this morning of June 19th, 1867, it will be dawn here in Carretero. In 20 minutes, the sun will rise over the Hill of Bells, the execution grounds about one mile from this convent. And at that time, unless President Benito Juarez intervenes in the condemned man's behalf, the 35-year-old Archduke Maximilian of the Habsburgs, the former Emperor of Mexico, will die before a firing squad of the Republic of Mexico. The Archduke will be taken from his cell about a hundred feet from this newsroom, escorted to the Hill of Bells, where seven Republican soldiers will level their guns at Maximilian and his... June 19, 1867, Peretaro, Mexico. You are there. The fate of the romantic Maximilian rests in the hands of a realistic man of the people, Benito Juarez. CBS takes you back to the climactic moments in the life of the last crowned head to rule in North America. All things are as they were then, except for one thing. When CBS is there, you are there. You are there is based on authentic historical fact and quotation. And now, a convent in Mexico and down Hollandaise extended the life of the Archduke for three days until dawn this morning. If President Juarez means to spare the life of Maximilian, there is little time for him to do so. The President is now in his executive offices at San Luis. Meanwhile, there is mounting international pressure upon Juarez to commute Maximilian's death sentence and send the former emperor back to Vienna. Eloquent pleas and protests from all over the world have been pouring into San Luis, and the rumor persists that Juarez may decide before the sun rises to heed those pleas for the life of the tragic Habsburg. And now for a report on those protests, we take you to San Luis and Ned Calmer. President Juarez has now heard from all the crowned heads of Europe. The royal houses have formally pledged that if Juarez pardons the Archduke, neither he nor any other royal personage will ever return to Mexico. But curiously enough, protests against Maximilian's execution have been coming in also from democratic quarters throughout the world. Secretary of State Seward, on behalf of the United States government, wired President Juarez that, I quote, harsh measures would not raise the character of the United States of Mexico in the esteem of the civilized peoples. Messages have also arrived from Victor Hugo, the noted French novelist, and Giuseppe Garibaldi, the great Italian liberator. Our overseas staff has made special tape recordings on which Monsieur Victor Hugo and Signor Garibaldi personally speak excerpts from their messages. Here is the first. Victor Hugo speaking. I have today telegraphed the President of the Republic of Mexico. Juarez, this will be your second victory. The first in overcoming usurpation is superb. The second in forgiving the usurper will be sublime. Let the Republic rest on the command of God. Thou shalt not... And now the voice of Giuseppe Garibaldi. To His Excellency Benito Juarez, I have said, Juarez, you rose from a humble toiler in the Sierra of Oaxaca to become the great laborer of liberty, civilization, and progress. Because of your deeds and your virtues, you have been rightly hailed the Lincoln of Mexico. Now, add to your deeds and to your virtues and spare Maximilian. This is Ned Calmer. I return you to Don Hollenbeck in Carretero. The question is, will President Juarez be influenced by this mounting tide of pleas, protests, and threats? Here at our microphone is a young lady who personally pleaded with Juarez for Maximilian's life as recently as 72 hours ago. She is the Princess Salm Salm, an American born in New York, used to be a bareback rider in a circus. Then she married Prince Salm Salm, an aide to Maximilian. Princess Salm Salm, when you came to him to beg for the life of the emperor, what did President Juarez say? Juarez is no president. He's a monster, an Indian devil. I fell on my knees before him. I wept. I cried, save him, save my emperor. But that, that fiend... 
didn't shed a tear, not a single tear. But did he say anything to you, Princess? He sniveled. The president of Mexico sniveled. Then he tried to raise me up. Princess, he said. Princess, all the sovereigns of Europe were at my knees. I could not spare your Maximilian. It is not I who am taking his life. It is the law and the people. The people. What is that... Indian know about people to kill the father of all people. Well, then, in your opinion, Princess Salm Salm, President Juarez will not be influenced. No. He will not spare the life of Maximilian. No, 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 no. There will be no pardon. Juarez the stone and my emperor will die at dawn. Poor Max. If he had to die, he should have gone to heaven three days ago. He was ready then. But now, when the dawn breaks, he must die again. Why? Why must he die twice? Why? Well, is it true, Princess Salm Salm, that you are now technically under arrest for being involved in a plot to bring about the escape of Maximilian? Arrest? What does arrest mean? I would give my life, my body, my soul to free Max. And I tried, believe me, I tried. But the others were all cowards. The Austrian minister signed the check and then wait, he had his wait, name... Wait, wait, what check, Princess? The check, the check for $100,000 that the Austrian minister signed... I was to use it to bribe the guards. But I failed. I failed my ma- my emperor. I failed miserably. Thank you, Princess Sam Sam. We do appreciate your speaking to us. The princess has just said that Juarez declared it was not he who is taking the life of Maximilian, but the law and the people. And as for the law, let's hear now what one of Mexico's great legal minds has to say. Senor Mariano Riva Palacio the man who defended Maximilian at his court-martial. Senor Palacio, is there anything in the law of Mexico that can save the Archduke's life? Yes. If the law of Mexico were properly administered, it would snatch the Archduke from the firing squad. Well, it's your opinion, then, that the law has not been properly administered. It has not. I deny now, as I denied during the court-martial, the competency of the court to try my client. Let us look at the charge, eh? Maximilian was accused of being a rebel, a usurper of public power, an enemy of the independence and security of the nation, a disturber of order and public peace, and a violator of international law and individual rights. I ask you, senor, is that a reasonable charge? Well, isn't it based on the Mexican Constitution? No. These sonorous phrases are fit only for novelists, not for the courts of Mexico. Juarez knows that. Well, Juarez himself is an attorney, isn't he? Yes, he's a great lawyer. He knows that if Maximilian is a rebel, he should be tried by a civil court. Well, isn't Maximilian a rebel? No, he is a prisoner of war. And as a prisoner of war, he should be set free when the war is over. What is more, this is a civil war between the forces of Maximilian and the forces of Juarez. In the United States, you have just ended a civil war. Did Abraham Lincoln shoot the Confederate President Jefferson Davis? No. And I say to you now that if Juarez is as compassionate and as logical as Lincoln... And I believe he is. He must let Maximilian remain alive. But there are Mexican patriots who argue that Maximilian must be punished for the blood that's been shed these past four years. Punishment, yes, but why punish a dupe? An innocent dupe who came here with pitiful illusions that he was welcome as an emperor. A great liberal monarch who would work hand in hand with Juarez to create noble social reforms. Thank you, Senor Palacio. The attorney's point that Maximilian was an innocent dupe brings up the question, who did the duping? Who are the guilty? What are their motives? For an examination of those questions, here is Quincy Howe, as recorded earlier today in London. As the best-informed people in London see it, there seem to be three guilty groups with three sets of motives. First, Emperor Napoleon III of France and his half-brother, the Duke de Morny have allowed themselves to become the paid collection agents of a notorious Swiss banker named Yecker. This Yecker lent an earlier Mexican government $750,000 cash. He now demands $15 million back. That's 20 times as much as he lent. And Yecker promised to give the Duke de Morny a straight 30% commission if the Duke could persuade Napoleon to set up a Mexican government that would pay the $15 million. Maximilian tried to set up such a government. But Maximilian himself represents a different group with different motives. Maximilian belongs to the ancient House of Habsburg, which has one supreme purpose in this world, to destroy the French Revolution and all its works everywhere. 
This means the Habsburgs and their supporters also oppose our American Revolution and all those Latin American revolutions that overthrew Spanish rule and established republics in the New World. The Habsburgs and their supporters want to set the hands of the clock back to the year 1500 to reassert the divine right of kings, to restore some of the power and prestige that the Roman Catholic Church has lost since the time of the Protestant Reformation. Certain British conservatives, whom the late Lord Palmerston used to lead, represent the third guilty group in Mexico. They did not back either Yaka or the House of Habsburg openly, but they did welcome Napoleon's attempt to set up Habsburg rule in Mexico because it seemed likely to weaken the Monroe Doctrine and to give Mexico a government through which foreign capital could exploit the country. But Palmerston did not represent the mass of the British people any more than the Habsburgs represent the mass of the people of Europe. As a result, public opinion here in England, and on the continent too, has little sympathy for the guilty groups whose mixed motives have brought tragedy both to Maximilian and to Mexico. This is Don Hollenbeck in Caratero. You've just heard Quincy Howe by transcription in London. And now we've just had word that Maximilian has completed his final devotions, and for a first-hand report from Maximilian's cell, we switch now to Richard C. Hotlet. The emperor's cell is small and narrow. There's an iron bed, a simple washstand, and three chairs. With the emperor in these last moments are his confessor, Father Hilarion Frias y Soto, who, oddly enough, is a follower of Juarez, and also José Luis Blasio, Maximilian's secretary. The emperor is standing here with me. Your Majesty, would you care to make a statement? What is there to say? I have just learned that my poor Queen Carlotta is dead, and because of this I go to my grave more tranquilly. She was my only remaining earthly tie, and now she's in heaven. But, Your Majesty, the rumor of the Empress Carlotta's death has been denied. Rumor? What shall we say of rumors? There is also a rumor that Juarez will spare my life. But it does not matter. I deserve to die. My only wish, which was Carlotta's too, is that we be buried beside each other. And I believe she is dead. I believe she died of grief and a broken heart. For she went to Europe to plead with Napoleon to honor his treaty not to withdraw his troops until my Mexican empire was firmly established. Now the whole world knows how a Bonaparte keeps his word. But, sir, why did you continue to fight after Napoleon had withdrawn his troops? For honor? My mother urged me to fight for the honor of the Habsburgs. And the clergy in Mexico promised me arms and money. And those Mexicans who hate Juarez promised me armies. But the armies never arrived. Poor fool that I was to believe them. And the crowned heads of Europe, Your Majesty, are still pleading for you. Franz Josef, your own brother. My is... own brother, my dear beloved Franz Josef. What is he but another poor relative of Bonaparte's, like myself? Where was Franz Josef when I was tried in a mock spectacle on the stage of a theater here in Querétaro? My beloved brother was in a Viennese music hall. And Napoleon was at the opera in Paris. Now, the crowned heads of Europe did not attend my command performance. And uh, when my Queen Carlotta went to the Pope in Rome, he too said that, unfortunately, he could not help us now. We must wait, he said. Wait. The Pope thinks of time in terms of eternity. But I see now that the soldiers of Juarez have come to lead me to the end of my time. The firing squad has come up and halted in the corridor outside the city. The commander of Maximilian to take his place with Generals Mejia and Miramon, the two other condemned men. Blasio, the Emperor's secretary, has cried out. He's weeping. Father Hilarion has begun to pray. Your Majesty, is there anything further you wish to say? Yes. I hope that my comrades, General Mejia and General Miramon, will be spared. They are good men. General Miramon was once president of Mexico, and General Mejia's wife has just borne him a new child, and she's mad with grief. The Archduke has walked calmly out of his cell into the corridor. 
He has taken his place beside his comrades in death. and The death procession is on its way down the corridor now. Here in the empty cell, the silence of death already reigns. A single candle sputters on an improvised altar. Ken Roberts is waiting at the entrance to the convent to follow the procession to the Hill of Bells when it emerges. So over to... I switch you instead to our CBS News headquarters here in the convent and Von Hollenbeck. Maximilian's queen, her royal highness, the Empress Carlotta, is alive. That fact has been confirmed by Arthur Hannes in Europe. Hannes is now at Miramar Castle on the shore of the Adriatic Sea near Trieste, ready to talk with her royal highness. Hannes tells us that it is true that Carlotta had suffered a nervous breakdown due to the grief and tension brought on by her unsuccessful audience with the Pope to save the empire. She collapsed in the Pope's chambers, was taken to Miramar Castle, and placed under her physician's care. However, she has now recovered sufficiently, and she has her doctor's permission for this interview, so we take you to Miramar Castle near Trieste and Arthur Hannes. Your Royal Highness, is there anything you would care to say at this moment? Yes, I would like to say that we must save the Indians of Mexico. That is the task that God has set for Maximilian and myself. And even without my beloved Max, I must go on. But your royal highness, you will no longer... If the Indians flourish, the empire will flourish. I am thrilled with enthusiasm. I have developed social theories on the cause of the revolution in Mexico. We must restore the dignity of the Mexican Indians. Maximilian and I will restore to humanity millions of men. We will not ask help of Bonaparte. We will do it ourselves. We will create a great liberal empire and the Indians will be our citizens. Of course, Your Royal Highness. But do you not realize that at this moment, Maximilian... Is ah, in yes, yes. My Max is in danger. And I suppose I am poisoned by our enemies. If I should be poisoned, let me not be embalmed or lie in state. Let me be buried in the simplest way in St. Peter. Near the tomb of the apostle. Ah, but what will become of our empire? An air. An air a sun to carry on the glorious destiny of an empire for the people. Ah, forgive me, Max. My Lord of Earth, forgive me, for I have not borne you a child. Why? Why are we not among the blessed who have given children to the earth? Your Highness, perhaps Juarez... Ah, Juarez! The Liberal Party of Juarez is the most hideous form of demagogy... This party is singing its one song. It is blazing up, blazing, do you hear? It is struggling against state, against law and justice. It will sink into the grave. In the slimy grave. All is slime and poison. Your Highness, Ma, Ma, my beloved sovereign of the universe, I bid thee farewell. God is calling me to him. I thank you for the happiness which you have always given me. May God bless you and help you to eternal peace. You will live forever. Peace be with you, your royal highness. This is Arthur Hannes in Trieste. I return you to CBS in Mexico. This is Ken Roberts with the CBS mobile unit following the execution procession to the center of our companions, the Hell of Bells. There are three carriages in the procession, 
Maximilian arrives in the first, General Miramon in the second, and General Mejia in the last carriage behind which marches the firing squad. All three carriages are plain black handsomes drawn by black horses. They are escorted by a strong detachment of cavalry and infantry. The procession moves slowly through the streets of Carretero. It is dawn. The first light has broken out on the distant hill of bells, and the sun is rising over the blue hills surrounding Carretero. All along the way, blinds are drawn over all the windows. Doors are shut. But there are a few spectators following this last cortege of the former emperor of Mexico. They are, these followers for the most part, women. They are weeping as they walk behind the carriages. Perhaps they remember now how during the final siege of Carretero, when Juarez's forces surrounded the city, the young archduke mingled freely with the people and shared their meager rations. Riding with us in our mobile unit is Captain George Monrique, a Republican officer, leader by General Mejia. Oh, a, a woman has run up to the carriage directly in front of us, General Mejia's carriage. She has a baby in her arms. She's screaming. Hanging onto the carriage with one arm and being dragged into the street. The guards are trying to loosen her grip. They pull her away, but she's still fighting on her and trying desperately to get back to the carriage. We are passing her right now. Who is that woman? What is she shouting? That is the wife of General Mejia. That child in her arms was born but a few days ago. She is pleading for the life of her husband. Captain, did you know General Mejia? Yes. As a matter of fact, I fought under him when I first came to Mexico. I don't understand, Captain. You fought under the general and now you are with Juarez? I am a Frenchman. I came to Mexico with the armies of Napoleon. I was told we were putting down a tyrant. But the tyrant proved to be not Juarez, but Maximilian. It was Maximilian who signed the Black Decree of October 3rd. You mean, Captain, the decree that all Mexicans who were caught carrying arms for the Republican forces were to be summarily shot? Yes. It was the most infamous day in history, a day of massacres. I was detailed to shoot brave soldiers that were captured. There was no pardon for them. I deserted to Juarez, and I am not ashamed. And there were thousands of other French soldiers who deserted with me. This is Ned Calmer in San Luis at the executive offices of President Juarez. We have interrupted Ken Roberts, and on behalf of the combined correspondents here in San Luis, I am privileged to speak with the President of Mexico. President Juarez, you said you had a statement concerning Maximilian? I know that many people throughout the world are waiting to hear that I will pardon Maximilian. Senor... Maximilian came to Mexico and had the audacity to invite me to collaborate with him. And I answer him, Sir, it is given to men to attack the rights of others, to take their property, to take the lives of those who defend their liberty and to make of their virtues a crime and of their own vices a virtue. But there is one thing which is beyond the reach of perversity, and that is the tremendous verdict of history. History will judge us. We must trust in history and in the people. And everything will yield to our will, however stormy the situation may be that awaits us. The people love independence and democracy, and they have no trust for monarchs and moneylenders. The evils of the invaders are too long to recount. The text is long, and the preacher is tired. Although the greatest criminals will go unpunished, and they are Napoleon and the banking house of Yeka, Maximilian must pay. Does that mean, President Juarez, that you will not halt the execution of Maximilian? 
the tomb of Maximilian and the others will be the redemption of the misled. Thank you, President Juarez. This is Ned Calmer in San Luis. I return you to Ken Roberts in Caretaro. I am on the Cerro de las Campanas, the Hill of Bells. The firing squad and the three who face it are in their appointed places. The great silent crowd here is hemmed in by a square of 4,000 troops. The officer who will give the command to fire has just talked to the Archduke. Maximilian asked him if any of his royal entourage were present. He was told that his faithful manservant, Dulos, was the only one. And a moment ago, Maximilian gave each of the seven soldiers of the firing squad one ounce in gold with the request that they take good aim at his heart. Maximilian has yielded the place of honor in the center to General Midamon as a tribute to a good soldier. Maximilian will die first, but now he is speaking. Maximilian has just said, I forgive everybody. I pray everyone may also forgive me, and I wish that my blood, which is about to be shed, may be for the good of the country. Long live Mexico. Long live independence. The officer has raised his saber. Of the seven guns, one holds a blank cartridge, so he goes. Brought it down, the soldiers have fired. Maximilian fell face downward on the ground. He's writhing as he lies there. He cried out as he fell. I think his words were, Andre, Andre, man, man. The officer has walked quickly over with a soldier. The officer points his saber to Maximilian's heart and orders him to grasp him. One shot. His pain is over now. And the pain, too, of the abortive rule of a Habsburg on the Western Hemisphere. Now comes General Miramon's turn. Oh, almost silent, they seem to be shocked by the sight of the man who was once their emperor as he... June 19, 1867. Maximilian, emperor of Mexico, is dead. <laughs> <laughs> 